Municipal governments are comprised of local elected officials, encompass a range of administrative bodies, including cities, towns, villages, and municipal districts. This is the Political Trenches Local Government at Work, the show dedicated to talking about the most pressing issues confronting municipal governments throughout Canada. I, along with Ian McCormack, will provide insights and perspectives on the challenges and opportunities that confront local governments as they strive to serve their communities. We continue our journey through the municipal alphabet, and today we bring you the letter P, which stands for policing. Later in the episode, Ian and I will be joined by the president and co-founder of the Coalition for Canadian Police Reform. First, we have a cross-country show ready for you. We are heading to Annapolis County in Nova Scotia, where residents are asking the province to step in and reduce the size of its council. Then we're jumping into Manitoba, where two councillors from the rural municipality of Springfield are accused of accusing a company, accusing a company. Why can I not read today, Chris? But first, we're heading on a cross-country tour. We are heading to Annapolis County in Nova Scotia, where residents are asking the province to step in and reduce the size of its council. Then in Manitoba, where two councillors from the rural municipality of Springfield are accusing a company of bullying. And then we will end off in British Columbia, where the city of Langford is amending its code of conduct in wake of a raucous council meeting. But first, it's been a month. Ian, how are you? Yeah, it's been a good summer. Uh, I think it's been more than a month, actually, Chris, but uh, maybe not. Maybe time just flies where you are and drags where I am. Yeah, it's been a good summer. You? It has been an amazing summer, but I'm glad we're back at it. And I want to start, as we said, in uh, Nova Scotia, where the residents of the municipality of the county of Annapolis have told the province of Nova Scotia Review Board they want a smaller council because a public survey supports the move and it could save money. The Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board held a public hearing uh, earlier this month on the municipality's boundary review application in which the county is asking to keep its 11 districts. The county details how a survey done last year saw a turnout of about 400 respondents, which municipal staff said was one of the highest engagements ever. The winning choice for that survey was about 29%, saying cis districts and a mayor would suffice with a second highest votes being coming in for eight districts and a mayor ian this smells like a conflict of interest where the municipality is asking for the status quo while the people of the community are asking for change how should municipalities balance the perceived conflict of interest when dealing with matters related to council elections that's an interesting uh, angle you've taken on that in terms of conflict of interest. I think, Chris, um, you know, very few, if any, politicians are really interested in voting themselves out of a job. And that's often why these changes, well, maybe always, why these changes will happen during the course of a municipal election cycle. So the next cycle will, uh, I think, actually, I think the next cycle is this year, if not next year in Nova Scotia. So this is something that's pending. The size of a council, well, this is fundamentally about representative democracy, right? So in a, a large council, uh, there are each, each councillor represents fewer people. In this case, if you divide the population by the number of councillors, you get about 1,700 people per councillor or council member. So that's actually quite low. Um, certainly, they could represent 2,000, 3,000 people. So I don't know that the argument uh, there in terms of representative democracy really holds because I think There's a lot of overhead that comes with uh, elected officials. But I don't necessarily know that there's a huge conflict of interest here. The other thing is, if you look at the the total numbers of people who were part of this this survey, those who it was a self-selected response. So it was not necessarily statistically valid. At least I believe it was self-selected. So people could choose whether to reply or not. And in, in such a case... You take it, you, meaning an elected official, would take it as one source of input amongst others. This group would weigh in, other citizens groups may weigh in, the province may have an opinion, the municipality itself may have an opinion too. So somewhere in there lies the truth. So councils, we're seeing more and more things like municipal amalgamations happening in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick and whatnot. It's akin to something like that as well, where the larger size is represented by fewer people. So rather than amalgamating municipalities, what they're doing here appears to be keeping the municipality the same, but reducing the number of people who actually are represented, uh, sorry, who are acting as elected representatives within that municipality. 
Now we're going to head over to Manitoba, where two Manitoba councillors say the company behind a controversial silica sand mining project is considering taking legal action because of their outspoken opposition. Alberta-based mm-hmm. CEO Silica wants to set up a silica sand mining operation in an area near Vivian in southeastern Manitoba. This would include extracting up to 1.36 million tons of silica sand per year by drilling more than 1,000 wells in the area. It has raised fears within the RM of Springfield that the project could contaminate their drinking water. Now, Ian, voicing concerns from residents as a public official comes with the territory, but it also yep. comes with a balance. What should councillors, and particularly these two councillors, do when speaking out, which could potentially lead to a, a lawsuit? where they're being accused of being against a proposed mining facility in their comp- in their area. Sure. They, these counselors, again, from what I know and what I've, read, what I've read, are acting in what they believe to be the best interest of the municipality. So even if they're named in a lawsuit, chances are it's the municipal corporation that they are a part of, not separate and apart from that, unless sometimes in cases of gross negligence, which certainly doesn't seem to be the case here, would they have to stand alone? So this, to me, really rubs me the wrong way. If this is a a private interest that is interested in something that's going to generate revenue, a profit for the the private interest, it smacks a little bit of things like intimidation uh, of elected officials. And I I don't think that that's that ought not to work. And it's a bit of a, I think, a precedent maybe or a case study on how far the authority of local government goes here. And mines and minerals, what happens under the land sometimes, well, often, is not within provincial purview, sorry, within municipal purview anyway. So there might be a little bit of a sticking point there between what the municipality wants and say what the province or the federal government is actually regulating and legislating on. So those sort of changes are things that the municipality can weigh in on, but may ultimately not have the final say. Other than some of the concerns that they have raised, Things like their master plan, their community plan, official plan, municipal development plan, bylaws that they may have around zoning and those sorts of things too, which is not necessarily yes or no, but where you can actually do something like this. The contamination of the groundwater is probably something that, well, it is something that you hear very regularly when disturbance of the earth in some fashion happens, whether it's drilling for something or digging for something or building something. Uh, the local government officials are responsible for looking after the best long-term interests of their residents and their own businesses for that matter too. So sometimes there can be an issue there. I, I re- This really does not put the company in a very good light though, from what I've seen. Now, the CBC article that we're quoting from here says that the letter that the two councillors did get from the company is considering action for misfeasance in public office. Now, I'm not a lawyer, Ian. Uh, You have probably done a few uh, audits of governance. Uh, Have you ever heard this term ever thrown around in a municipal setting? Because I've never considered that the act of misfeasance in public office would ever be a considered a legal term that people can sue on. No, but I haven't heard of it, but that would be, I'm not an expert in Manitoba. So maybe, it, maybe there is something going on at this point. However, normally when, when something like this happens, and if I'm accusing an elected official of doing something they ought not to have doing done beyond the bounds of their job, I go at it after the council code of conduct or some provincial legislation about the role of individual members of council or as council as a whole. Maybe there's a legal term that the, the one you reference is a legal term, but it's not one that I've heard used before. It code of conduct stuff. If there's something about a council doing what they ought not to be doing. The one word that I took away from this article was the delay, the delay of the project. Now, I know, and I believe you know, and people who are probably listening and watching this probably know, that councillors can take as long as they want to uh, make a decision. They can uh, delay third reading because they want more information. They can delay first reading going into second reading uh, if they don't get unanimous support. Um, Delays happen in municipal governments, and I, I think that businesses don't think that it should, but sometimes municipal councillors do need the chance to get more information from the public, from the administration from scientists, from their legal experts. So delaying a project like this isn't uh, uncommon, is it? 
no, not not at all. I don't think so. It's, and then some of them are delayed for political reasons, some of them for environmental reasons, some for procedural re uh, reasons. And I would say you talked about more information. When a topic like comes up like this, where there are pros and cons, multiple sides, multiple opinions, sometimes multiple versions of the truth, eventually it comes to council to make the choice. And the choice is a binary one, yes, no. Uh, and at that point, you, you, you can request more information as a member of a council. But if it's not going to change your opinion from a yes to a no or vice versa, then more information is probably not terribly helpful and you will never get all the information because all the information sometimes is around conjecture and opinion and it, it modifies itself over time. So councils eventually have to say at some point, based on what we know, this is the decision that we will make, which sometimes I mean, you can reconsider those later on too, but they're, they're beholden to the people who elected them not to the people who are coming looking for some change to be made within the municipality. During the first week of uh, September, Langford Council amended its code of conduct policy during a raucous meeting earlier, where proceedings halted for nearly 20 minutes after a man charged the podium and began yelling at the council. The changes stem from a report by the BC Office of the Ombus Person over concerns that Councillor Lillian Spack made inquiries about a parking dispute involving her son and another Langford resident last year. While the report said the councillor asked senior staff to find a solution to the dispute, creating a perception of bias, it concluded that there was no administrative unfairness by the city councillor or city staff. The ombudsman person did, however, recommend that the city's code of conduct passed in February and limited to members of council making complaints be amended to allow complaints to be made by municipal staff and committee members. Several speakers during this council meeting uh, were cut short by points of order where one councillor saying that they could not speak about the report because it was not on the agenda, even though the report was referred to in the Code of Conduct amendments that were on the agenda. Ian, stories similar to this are becoming more often in Canada. We are seeing become, people become uh, coming to council looking for answers and wanting them addressed. How should council ensure the safety of themselves while ensuring that residents feel that their issues are being heard? You know, you made a reference earlier about more and more, and I've seen this more and more too. In fact, when we did the Bucking the Trend Symposium last spring, this was one of the topics we addressed too. It's a very unfortunate I do see it as a bit of a side effect of things like populism, um, the coffee shop senates that appoint themselves, of, of citizens groups which are uh, really just advocacy groups for one particular point of view or another. And in this case, it, I'm a big proponent of having the rules written. In this case, code of conduct or codes of conduct or procedure bylaws even things that go on the wall of council chambers about respect and respectful workplaces. Because at that point, then the argument is not between you and me, Chris, it's between you and whatever is agreed to as a, by a council already. And so it's already something written. So it, it's a, you disagreeing with a council decision that's been made around a policy or something. So I think that's one way around it. <laughs> Fundamentally, I don't know that the people who are, going to be standing up and stomping are the ones who are necessarily going to follow the rules. So at some point, making an, making an example out of some of these people by applying the rules appropriately, having people removed from chambers uh, has happened multiple times. Uh, that's pretty awful to have to do because it's a public, uh, public space. We've seen on things like live streamed meetings where more people are watching than are actually there. Somebody's microphone gets cut off for whatever reason happens to be. So that's another way to do it. City of Leduc in Alberta uh, went through a situation like this on a different topic, of course. Uh, mayor declared a recess, cut off the microphone, declared a recess. Council left for a little while. So left left the person at the podium who was who was ranting uh, to, th to themselves to do it. Cut off the video feed so nobody else saw it either. So those are some ways to get around this, but this bad behavior is nothing that is is nothing but growing at the moment. And I, we're putting up with it. And some of it's about theater. Some of it is about opinions that don't necessarily hold up to fact or science. Some of it is about pure partisanship. Uh, all those sort of things are showing more and more. And until 
until governments stop accepting this and promoting it in some cases, we're not going to see a whole lot of change on this one. But I think the the, the suggestions of the changes to the code of conduct here were, particular, were certainly valid. And the, I, I, if I may, if ahead. I may though, too, the, the topic itself about should an elected official interfere on behalf of a family member? Obviously not, right? They, they, uh, the elected official can refer the family member to the right place, and they would because they would for any other citizen as well. But if the elected official went and sat down in a somebody other than the CAO's office and said, "We need to do something about that," that's wrong, and I, that ought to be showing up in terms of a code of conduct investigation in and of itself, which is kind of where this one went, and I think that was an appropriate place for it to go. You, you took my question right out of my mouth there, Ian, <laughs> but I'm going to ask a follow-up question to that. Sure. And it's particularly about this meeting because uh, I, I, while this is BC, so they may have different rules here, but I want, yep. I want to know the Alberta context here. So Councillor Colby Harder, Harder, yes, uh, kept on making points of order because the speakers were talking about the report that was not on the agenda, but it was referenced in the Code of Conduct amendments. Can that happen? So uh, if I call a point of order, that means you have an issue with what's being said. Um, if someone is bringing up something that references another document, do they have mm -hmm. the right to make that point of order? Because I think, and this is where I'm looking at it from an outsider's perspective, the amount of point of orders, because I went back and I watched the Langford City Council actual council meeting, and I saw what was happening, the amount of point of orders that were coming through would have frustrated me as well. So from an outsider's perspective, does a counselor have the right to make a point of order if a report references a report and the report <laughs> isn't what you're talking about? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, certainly the as long as it's in the procedure bylaw and if the procedure bylaw is silent, as long as it's in the rules of order, uh, Roberts or whatever that council uses, as long as it's, it's dealt with there, sure, points of order, points of privilege, those sort of things are perfectly valid. But those ones need to be ruled on by the chair mayor in this case. So the mayor can say yay or nay to accepting that point of order. And at that point, if council doesn't agree with the mayor, they can vote to challenge the chair. So there are procedural ways of dealing with that as well. Once it's been dealt with once, however, <clears throat> the decision has been made, it, the same topic ought not to come up again and again and again. That now starts to get into just obst obstification of the business of government. We'll be right back after a quick break with our interview with David Castles, president and co-founder of the Coalition of Canadian Police Reform. Welcome to P is for Policing on the Political Trenches, Local Government at Work. Today, we are honoured to have David Castles, president of the Coalition for Canadian Police Reform. After dedicating three decades to the Edmonton Police Force, David assumed the role of Chief of Police in Winnipeg. He brought his extensive expertise to bear on numerous governmental and community boards at the level, local, provincial, and national levels, including a notable stint as, on the advisory board of the Law Commission of Canada. During his tenure as Winnipeg's police chief, David spearheaded a comprehensive departmental reorganization championing the implementation of decentralized community policing model. Over the past 22 years, David has lent his consultancy services to various governmental departments and co-founded the Coalition of Canadian Police Reform. So David, welcome to the Political Trenches. Thank you, uh, Chris. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'm going to start off a line of questioning here, and it's always weird to start a line of questioning to a former police chief, but I'm so happy I get to do <laughs> that. So, David, can you give us a quick overview of the mission of the Coalition for Canadian Police Reform? Of course. Uh, the Coalition for Canadian Police Reform was uh, formed by a group of concerned citizens who were essentially tried to elevate the police profession in Canada. This training in Canada is very short, and very subjective, and it's completely inconsistent from one department to another or one province to another. Our hope, uh, our vision is to see the creation of national training and education standards guided by a college 
of professional policing. Uh, the current curriculum today is, uh, as I said, too short. Most are 24 weeks across Canada. Uh, they are very, uh, very in length from Quebec at 15 weeks to the RCMP, for example, 27 weeks, uh, some as, as long as 28 weeks in British Columbia. Even then, the curriculum itself is not evidence-based. Uh, it's usually locally based. Uh, some some is very old, outdated, uh, sort of paramilitary model. We believe, like doctors, or um, nurses, and lawyers, and even technicians, accountants, that we need to elevate the profession. For example, six months to become a police officer in Canada, 48 months to become a nurse. And the police play a very, very important role in society. We believe that the profession needs to be elevated in this. See the creation of a college of people. I'd like to jump in here if I can just a little bit too. So you've obviously had a look or you and your colleagues have seen how policing operates across the country, um, whether it's a, a national service like the RCMP or a local one or a provincial one too, for that matter. You've, all, you've probably had a look beyond that as well. Are there, is there a place you would think does it best that you think would where you could we ought to be emulating or bits and pieces coming from various, various places? David, the Seem to make well, sense. there are very, there are fairly good training programs and, and police education programs in Canada. Please don't misunderstand it. But it's the inconsistency that is so important to bring, to elevate the profession, to, to function to a true profession. But an example that I would give you that there are two uh, that are very important that we would like to model. We'd like to see a model in Canada. We'd like to see the federal government create the legislation to create the college, and the college would be the research. But the UK College of Policing is one example. There are other uh, colleges of policing in other democracies that are just starting. The Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Canada is a model that we would like to do. That is a model where all doctors across Canada must achieve certain standards. And the, uh, the medical institutions all across Canada teach the same curriculum. So therefore, you know when you're getting your in a general practitioner or a specialist in medicine across the country, you're going to get a very high level of professional service. Now, it is not the same. When you when you deal with a police officer in Nova Scotia, or and I'm just using examples uh, in Calgary or even Edmonton, you may not be dealing with a police officer that has a understanding of racism and the impact of racism. How to deal with their own personal bias. Understands emotional intelligence skills. Understand the effect of the residential schools and the 60s school and many other things on indigenous people. Immigrants, for example, there are many immigrants, as you know, are afraid of the police. They don't understand the role of the police in the world. But the police that themselves that are trained, yes, they can march very well, and yes, they can shoot the firearm straight, and they can do all of the things that are very traditional. But the important things when it comes to dealing with people in our complex 21st century is missing. We believe those are the, and those are only a very few of the components that we believe are important. It must be included in a standardized professional education program for police officers across Canada. And there are many people who agree. And if I can go on just a little bit, there are many studies, the police sector council studies, the economics of police studies, many other commission reports, uh, public inquiries that have, that have recommended national training standards. Like the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, research to provide the best uh, training and education for our police officers. Uh, it is very, very difficult for a young police officer without somebody uh, empathy, emotional intelligence skills, and personal skills, and all the other things. And again, there are many more that are, that are absent. Uh, they, we send them out on the street with this basic paramilitary training and expect them to solve some of Canada's uh, complex social problems, whether it's mental illness and, and the list goes on and on and on. Uh, and that's why we believe that in cases uh, conflict occurs between police officers and the Canada. And, uh, and I said, uh, quite honestly, we may be setting them up for failure because we're not getting the schools to uh, and the schools 
they need to do with the home effect. Uh, we're seeing a lot more municipalities move to a municipal police force. We're seeing uh, the province of Alberta talk about a provincial police force. We're seeing the RCMP having their struggles with recruitment and retention around even police officers in more rural and remote communities. You, you talk about the training aspect of it and getting people into this. Why is it that there is the inconsistency? Because the police force is there no matter where we are in all parts of this country where we're under the umbrella of a police force, whether it be municipal, provincial, or even federal. But the inconsistency you're talking about seems to be disparaging that the training isn't happening. Why isn't it happening right now where people are getting together all three levels of government and saying, okay, we need to make a cohesive message and move forward why don't the government levels of government want to talk? I think the question is two part, Chris, and I think uh, I can answer it for you. Um, the British Columbia government is even thinking of a provincial police service. The Alberta government is thinking of a provincial police service. Grand Prairie, uh, Surrey are moving from the RCMP to a municipal police service. I think that's one issue, and that issue, I think, in my opinion, centers around having to have a really decentralized local community. Uh, the RCMP, while they're very, very committed, they have a long history in Canada, uh, they are essentially managed and guided uh, by Ottawa. Uh, everything that uh, is in their policies and procedures is developed in Ottawa. Uh, as the local uh, assistant commissioner in Alberta has said, it's difficult for the RCMP uh, to move quickly and to change things at, from a local level. They're not as nimble as a local police service can be. So a, a truly decentralized training policing model has to be managed and run by a local community. The whole uh, about community policing is to be able to have an open communication with local government and make shifts in priorities, uh, whether they're operational priorities or financial priorities or reducing the number of police officers or increasing them is made locally. And that, that just doesn't function when you're run by a large organization in a model. It's like trying to turn a massive ship around in a hurry when it's very, very difficult. Um, the other issue is around training. Uh, the governments themselves have recognized in the police sector such inconsistency that there needs to be standards in training and education. If you have the complex uh, notion now that uh, you have uh, both a federal, that is a, a, a federal government responsibility, and a provincial responsibility. So so our, our vision, of course, is to, and we've had, uh, if I could just step, take step out of your question, we've had a lot of constitutional and legal analysis that tells us that the federal government has four or five lawful and uh, proper ways under the Constitution to make uh, and uh, we hope that it's created. The provinces themselves would want to buy into it because they've seen the benefit of the national standards, and they could uh, they could administer a, a national certification program. Initially. And then, of course, the RCMP nationally could be part of this this approach. So, part of it, I think, well, a lot of it is political. The government decides if they'd like to replace the RCMP with uh, uh, local police states. And it's also provincial governments and the federal government that would have to be supportive partners in the quality of policing to ensure that uh, the training and education of the police is effective. Uh, and it's a model that works very well. It's a model that works very well with doctors, with the Royal College of Physicians and Engineers. They all have agreed to establish follow these national standards and license or certify or approve individual accountants or whatever it is under under that protocol. We believe the same model is very effective. Police officers, Chris, have a very important role. We have power of arrest, search, seizure, the use of deadly force, dealing with people in a very complex, fast moving change in society, and their training and education is simply not that's what's important to us. The, uh, Dave, you've met, you've talked about governments, provincial, federal, municipal. You've talked about some citizens as well. A lot, if uh, you probably know this, most most police services in Canada are probably unionized. 
What's the response, if any, from police unions about standardization of training or increasing the, the requirements or quality of training that's required? You know, that's a very good question. Ian, a lot of people would be surprised. Uh, the Canadian Police Association themselves, Tom, Tom Stanitak, as the president, has called for uh, better, more, more training and education and an entity like the college several years ago. Many of the police sector council studies said the same thing, the economics of police. Uh, uh, we have members uh, on our coalition that are former and serving police officers full well that this needs to change, and they're very supportive of it. Now, you will still get certain segments of uh, the police associations who are essentially union representatives that, that have a different vision. Maybe use of force and uh, other components are important to them, and maybe they've heard something bad about a particular uh, colleague somewhere else, and, and they may uh, be naysayers. And they may not be supportive. The reality is that the Canadian Police Association, uh, my last conversation with them, they fully support what we do. The Canadian Association of Police Governments fully support us. The, the Canadian Association of Chief Police is on side, while they haven't formally supported us, they're still on side and they have their own um, uh, committees that uh, recommend uh, national training standards on things like the use of force itself. And even the use of force training in Canada is inconsistent. The escalation, this surprises people. Even de-escalation training, when you de-escalate a very emotional situation before you apply the use of force, is inconsistent in some provinces and departments and non-existent. It's not even taught de-escalation, which people just find it shocking. But that just goes to show the inconsistency in the type of training that police have to be in our country. And I'm proud of the, um, of the function of policing, and I want to see uh, this. I want to see it elevated over time. And we know that it won't happen overnight. We know that we're into it for the long term. But it's like anything else. If it's important, we will consist We have hundreds of members. We have a very strong board of directors. We have uh, sort of behind the doors political support. And we must wait for the right opportunity to move forward. We had hoped that the Mass Casualty Commission and their recommendations. In fact, they did support our recommendations. They talked about a college for the RCMP, get away from the boot camp uh, training that they're going through in uh, Regina right now and broaden their knowledge and education. And the Mass Casualty Commission uh, made that recommendation. We would have hoped that was a catalyst. The public safety minister at the time would then realize how important it is to move in this direction. Uh, and we're hoping that that will still happen. We know we're into it for the long term. We know it's the right thing to do, and we will make it persistent. Take it in a slightly different direction as we come kind of cut it to the close here too, and that is over the course of your tenure in policing and probably those of your colleagues with the coalition as well, one of the big changes has been the rapidity and instantaneousness of communication, particularly around video and social media and things like that. And for some reason that seems to portray police as often in bad light as it does in good light. How is that having an impact on some of the standards that you're thinking about? Well, first of all, I think it's a good indication of why uh, things need to change. Uh, you know, any of these things, if it wasn't for high phones and social media, high phone uh, recordings and social media, would not be brought to light. Um, you know, from our perspective, the so social media is actually helping us get our message out and talking about the deficiencies in training and helping us get our message out. The use of body worn cameras for police officers to me is very important. Uh, you know, it, it shows you exactly what happened at the scene of a crime uh, or at the scene of an event or conflict or whatever it is. It's, I think they're invaluable. Expensive, but they're invaluable. Uh, so, uh, you know, to me, that's another reason why having national training standards is that communication is changing so fast in our world that our police officers are not keeping up. Many small departments and police departments are struggling uh, just to be able to understand how you can use social media for your advantage social media for investigation. Uh, uh, I mean, it's, there's so many things that we're not learning and we could be learning and benefit from and improve the quality of service delivery to the people of Canada. Uh, so I think, I actually think that the problem's helping us in our work. It's having a significant effect on policing and there's a way to manage it properly given uh, the right approach. Uh, so I don't know if I've answered your question, Ian, but that's my, my approach. Like I am very open, I believe in the media, whether it's social media or the regular media in Canada plays an important role in democracy, holding government accountable, holding the police accountable, 
Women lawyers and doctors are coming. Uh, I think it plays in a very, very important role in our I want to talk about the future because you talk about you needing to meet with the Minister of Public Safety. I'm assuming yes. that's not just federal, but you need to meet with his counterpart, Minister LeBlanc's counterparts in each province as well to get them to sign off. What What's happening behind the scenes right now that uh, Canadians can sort of breathe a sigh of relief that the reforms are coming and this organization, the Coalition for Canadian Police Reform, is at the front lines and actually spearheading this uh, reform? Well, first of all, we're pleased with the public safety minister. The public safety minister brings a new perspective to public safety in Canada. Uh, the public safety minister has the mass casualty commission on his desk. He's appointed he and the um, Attorney General in Nova Scotia have appointed a uh, a judge to ensure with a committee to ensure that these recommendations are implemented. They talk about uh, the need for a college for the RCMP. Uh, they talk, talk about changing the entire recruit training uh, in, in Regina, even moving from that facility because it has a very negative uh, in, impact from Indigenous people. Um, uh, we have a very strong board of directors uh, who uh, have some uh, contact with government, uh, and we're hoping behind the scenes that the door will open soon for the coalition to meet with the public safety minister. We would like to talk about how we can help the public safety minister move forward with some of this difficult thing, difficult issues that he has to deal with, and how our contribution will help improve public safety. So we're waiting um, to for the door to open. Uh, it's like anything else dealing with the, with the government; it takes time. Now, again, I want to make it clear that our vision is that the college would be created, the college would create the national standards like they do with doctors for and then the provinces would recognize the benefit and through a shared agreement would begin to join. They want to apply these standards under their own local peace acts or provisions and improve the training in our country. And they would be want to be a part of this because it's their benefit, um, both financially and not having to reinvent the wheel every time there's something new in place. Uh, every time there's something new, Donald, Calgary, and Edmonton do something different to try and deal with that issue, and they do it in their own way, and best practices are never shared. I mean, imagine a college like in medicine that would share all best practices in training and education and operational practices for peace officers. Calgary wouldn't have to struggle with it, neither would Edmonton. They realize the college has completed the research, after what happened in Toronto and Ottawa in this particular event, and develop a package around that. I mean, you have a central repository of the best practices and knowledge for everyone to draw from, which is, and without doubt, in the best interest of the Attorney General's uh, in each of the provinces across Canada. David, I want to thank you so much for doing this. It's always a pleasure to sit down with people who are instrumental in making our societies better. So thank you so much for the work you do, but also for the work that the Coalition for Canadian Police Reform does as well. So thank you. Thanks. Chris and Ian, thank you for having me. I truly appreciate so our full interview with David will be airing next Wednesday. But until then, just stay with us because we'll be right back after this quick message. Ian, another great episode. P is for policing. We're back after a summer hiatus. It seems like mm -hmm. uh, we got our groove back on. Yeah, that was a great. Great way to start off the new year. Hey, that's a, that's a very interesting organization. I've known about them for a little while, and I think they have some real, they've got some real work ahead of them, but I think they're on the right side of it. And I feel like we just scratched the surface with them. And I feel like there's probably more that we could probably discuss with them. But in our short time that we had with Dave, it's always appreciative when guests sit down with us. Yeah, it was great. I really enjoyed it. So we are off for another week and a half until our next episode, which is for Q, which for those who are listening and watching, if you have a suggestion, give us your input about what Q means to you in the realm of municipalities. It's always great to hear from you and it's always great to get your feedback. Um, Ian, what do, what do, what are you looking forward to over the next two weeks? Uh, getting back into the swing of things, we started into September. I actually just wrote a blog post about like back to school. And for a lot of our clients, it's back to school. It's a new year of all sorts of things for elected officials, for administrations. So we're starting to get our groove back as well. And I am just going to be sitting here interviewing municipal leaders from across Canada, as always. But until uh, two weeks from now, always a pleasure. Indeed. You too, Chris. We'll talk to you then.